In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zeiger livecast. Hello everyone, my name is Lars Boering, I'm the moderator of today. Welcome at the World Press Photo livecast number two um, concerning World Environment Day. We have a great program today for you, uh, many speakers from all over the globe that talk about environment, work on it, visualize it and uh, show us uh, the stories that, uh, that matter. World Press Photo uh, is supported by uh, the Postcard Lottery. Uh, the Dutch Postcode Lottery, and we have our partners PwC and Egon to support support our work. We are very happy with them that we can uh, help. Uh, they can help us to contribute doing our great work. Today we have many, many guests. Toby Smith of Climate Visuals. We have Jersey Brinkhoff telling us about the exhibition in uh, in Amsterdam. Esther Horvat, photographer. Christina Mittermeier, also a photographer and visual uh, storyteller. And we will have a little item about the PhotoQ bookshop. In the back, you will see all of our guests today. We will uh, talk to them in this hour and uh, go through this program. Um, we will start today with uh, Toby Smith. Um, he's the, uh, with Climate Visual uh, Program Lead. And Toby Smith uh, it works from the southwest of England. Uh, has 12 years of experience as an environmental and editorial photographer and Climate Visuals, that is a program of climate outreach, uses a evidence-based approach to design and catalyze a more compelling and diverse visual language for climate change. Toby, welcome to uh, our program of today. Thanks, we, Lars. Great, yes, great to be gonna here. Yes, we're going to show you in the screen. Um, tell us a little bit about the work of uh, climate outreach and climate visuals. Excellent, thank you. So we're, we're primarily a team of social scientists based out, based out the UK, but we work globally. And really, we focus on climate change, but we see that as a, an intersectional issue that works across uh, nearly all environmental topics as well. And really, the idea is that we're, we're trying to make sure that things are understood um, and accepted and actually acted upon. So we're kind of looking at using communications to increase um, impact. So next slide, please. And um, really, we see that as kind of through storytelling. And obviously, photography is a huge part of that. And really, climate change, we see it as a kind of socially constructed narrative um, conveyed by trusted communicators, which in this room, we can often focus on journalists and photojournalists working on environmental issues. Um, next slide, please. And really, the and next slide, please. The, the program that I head up, Climate Visuals, is quite specific. We're a small team and we focus on bridging the gap between visual research, uh, as in what makes compelling and impactful photography, with the practitioners, uh, editors, contributors, and also you know, photographers as mm -hmm. well. Can I, can I ask you a question, Toby? Um, Please do. Is, is, um, how, how did it start? Did, were you... Um, uh, the, the, the imagery that is used to visualize it, uh, it, it, at one point you must have found out together like this is not uh, working as well as we think it should be working or it's always the same images. Can you tell me why this, uh, this in, you initiated this? So the, the foundation of the program and I guess kind of our uh, unique aspect is that it's based on, an, on academic research into how people respond to images. So yeah. Back in 2016, there was quite a substantial academic study which measured people's behavioral response to images. So it used a big, a big library of climate change photography and there was uh, interviews and different results done as to how people actually emotionally, behaviorally respond to images as well as controlling for things like their demography, their uh, political persuasion to yeah. try and understand how people relate to work. All right, let's go to the slide uh, that you wanted to show. Thank you. So this is the original program. Uh, this is the original paper in 2016, and we'll we'll move on. Um, and we also, as part of that, we kind of constantly update the evidence. So um, we held a hackathon back in January. Uh, there's a, we managed to find 18 academics in Europe who actually focus specifically on how people respond to different photography. So it's taking a real 
analytical approach as well as a subjective approach to photography. Let me get next slide, please. Um, and our interfaces, we use this to curate um, a reference library. I think reference is the key word here because we, we host an image library that signposts to what we believe, believe is the most successful climate change photography um, out there, which is a combination of a subjective view of an editor and, and our view as, um, uh, as, as social scientists as well. Yeah. The next slide will uh, show uh, the Guardian, and uh, they had a, they've made a real commitment about uh, visualizing climate change. Right? Can you speak a little bit about it? Sure. So I think um, you know one of the things that is our is our work and our evidence is a guide. It's it's not definitive, and most of our interactions that we do are are really participatory. So the work we did with the Guardian is a, is a brilliant example where we actually take. The expertise and the knowledge the Guardian have about their own audiences and their photography, and we helped uh, the Guardian, much as they did with their their written language a few years back. We helped them develop um, new guidelines and a commitment to how they would use climate change imagery moving forward. Uh, as obviously the Guardian are committed not just to reporting on climate change, but they've made quite a stance to um, wanting to actually ensure that it's engaged with and acted upon as well. You have some examples for that as well, right? That's, that's the one that we see here? Yeah, so uh, we're, we're trying to engage in them in different ways. So it's either by, uh, in this example, recognizing uh, existing photography that we think uh, works really well to our principles. This is um, a climate solution, bringing solar powered lighting to, to slums in Mumbai, which has a double effect of uh, being climate change positive, but also has really great social benefits as well. And then we're also trying to do direct interventions where we're trying to fund photography um, where there's, there's, there's gaps in the narrative. So uh, we released a grant this year with Getty Images. Um, Aji Stiawan is doing a project on climate resilience in Indonesia. Um, and if you can advance two slides forward, we also um, funded Greg Khan out of Maryland in the USA. And we found this a fascinating pair because these are two photographers working locally with incredible depth and access to their communities, but they're covering identical climate change issues in you know very different political, geographic, and aesthetic um, scenes. Yeah. Move forward, please. Uh, yes. This is Greg's work, and then one more. Thank you. So there's uh, there's seven principles uh, that you use for climate visuals. That's going to be shown on the next slide. Um, can you talk us through it? Exactly. So, I mean, one of the reasons, one of the things we try and do is act as a bridge. So, it's all very well having social science research into what makes effective communications or engagement with people, but it's really important that we try and turn some of those learnings into something that's a lot more accessible for people. And the original research in our, our guidelines uh, was distilled into these seven principles. And I think the, the key thing here is that they're not hard and fast guides. These are these are kind of a um, you know, a playbook, if you would like, on how we on how to help people both interpret photography, edit photography, and also uh, commission photography. So, um, what I found really fascinating was I applied the seven principles to the, the three years of winners from the World Press uh, photo collection, and actually, um, this there was an amazing correlation as to what your your independent juries chose as being the best environmental photography and some of the, the research that we put out. So if I may, I'm going to quickly run through some of the seven principles and I'll use the, uh, some of the photography as a backdrop. Yes. So the first principle is, um, is show real people, if you can advance on. Um, and really the most important part about this is that um, audiences are incredibly um, savvy as to spotting real photography. So they favor authentic, credible images, which is what good photojournalism should all be about, with identifiable emotions. Um, and it might not be a surprise to anyone that um, any images of politicians uh, were responded with stress, cynicism and tiredness by our audiences, which um, I think we can all relate to in the last three years, maybe on the other side of the Atlantic as well. So um, if we could advance uh, the slide again. Um, so the other part, which I think World Press uh, Awards embodies is this concept of uh, telling new stories. I think that's something that a lot of photojournalists um, aspire to move on to. Um, I picked out Luca's work um, on the end of trash because this is, uh, you know, waste and recycling is not a new issue. 
uh, but to show uh, the kind of um, you know the cutting edge of, of science and technology really um, gives another kind of angle to this work. Um, and new stories get people engaged and it helps reframe climate change as um, a diverse issue as well. You know, thinking about food in different ways and thinking about um, our relationship to, to the environment. Uh, and I also particularly love this project because we're extremely keen to foster um, more dialogue around climate solutions in particular. So um, our third principle is we, we, love, uh, we love to have people show um, climate change causes at scale. Um, you know, when people view images, they, they don't often understand the connection between climate change and their own lives. Climate change is quite a, an intangible issue. It doesn't often have any kind of direct uh, visual elements to get your teeth into. So uh, it's really important to show these at scale. And I think the other element of um, showing things at scale is that uh, to take meat eating or vegetarianism as a potential climate solution, it's very, it's obvious and it's quite right that people often show defensive reactions if you highlight individual behavior, but actually, you know, showing uh, climate change causes or things that, um, you know, have a high CO2 level, showing them at scale, such as uh, George's work here in China, looking at meat production, is something that people are more likely to um, engage with. Uh, and I think that's also reflected in the idea that showing things at, at scale um, was really engaging with people, uh, regardless of their political persuasion as well. Whereas identifying individual issues, such as a single person driving a car, uh, just, just isn't that effective in the, in the work. Um, something that we can resonate with um, a lot at the moment is showing emotionally powerful impacts, especially um, at a local scale. So um, I wanted to highlight uh, a kind of running theme of the last couple of years was um, wildfires, both in Australia and the US. This is uh, Sean Davies' work in, in Australia. And we, we found that responders to our surveys are much more moved by climate impacts than causes or solutions. These are things that really affect people personally. Um, and I think it's also really important that in storytelling to to pair evocative imagery like such as this family here, um, you know, being resilient and almost kind of attempting to enjoy themselves in, in the horror of these fires in Australia. And to make stories and messaging really effective, we find that um, pairing it with solutions or kind of resilience is a really strong factor as well. Um, and a slide that I'm sure uh, two of the other speakers today will, will surely reflect on is, and this is an area where we're looking at doing some further research, is the idea of an emotional response we have to animals. And this is something that varies a lot across culture. People have a different response to, to animals um, and the sensitivities, but really it's that emotional connection um, that, that, that we see as being a core strength of images like this. Um, okay, so understanding your audience is obviously important as well. Uh, that's one of our principles. Um, this can be framed in a number of different ways. We think it's important to understand an audience from a political perspective. People from left and right interpret images differently. And also we view that uh, editors, uh, newspaper editors, the, the clients of photographers really understand their audiences. I think the best storytelling we've seen in climate change is where there's a, there's a partnership between the photographer and the editors to put out a story um, that works so well to the demography reading a newspaper. And I think this is something that um, I really see the role of a good photography editor being so important to make sure that photographers' uh, wider edits are tailored to their audience. Um, and it's also really important to show, you know, genuine and not staged diversity and diversity coverage and, you know, try and address some of the kind of systemic changes we need uh, to make sure environmental work is something that's looked at across society and recognize that within that messaging, it's not just um, who we represent in the photography, but the players in the system and the people making those photos as well. Yeah. Um, so just two more and then I'm, I'm wrapped. Um, the idea of showing local but serious impacts uh, is something that resonates as well. People are really affected by stories on their own doorstep. It really helps change government policy. 
Um, and then finally, the principle, apologies for going over time, is protest imagery. Um, protest imagery is, can be really divisive. I think it's often, uh, people often don't identify with classic environmentalists, but actually kind of broadening who is defined in 2020 as an environmental protester is something that um, really helps people engage with protesters, showing people at the front line of climate change, such as this work by Amber from Standing Rock. Um, I identified this as being really strong protest photography. Cool. Thanks, Lars. That's the, uh, yeah. the seven principles. You had one uh, one uh, final uh, observation that you wanted to share with us, which was the, uh, the environmental photography during COVID um and the challenge of the importance of environmental photography post covid what are what are your uh, your views on that i mean covid is a very strong topic and uh, and lots of people are working on it but uh, how does that affect uh, climate uh, change so i think one of the issues is that during covid as we're all reflected on before this call new and real environmental photography around current issues has effectively been brought to a halt as we're all locked down and it's, it's put a lot of pressure on stock and library imagery. This was my search on climate change in Google before this talk. And mm. I think everyone on this call can, can resonate that this is not powerful climate change photography. There is really systemic issues with how climate change is represented from our archive. Um, and if we can have the next slide as well, please. Um, one more. Um, there's also been this kind of excitement around the slight novelty value of a return to nature or, or how much COVID has, has helped the environmental movement. I think we need to be sensitive to the reality and the practicality of this messaging and make sure that we remain um, on track and don't let the, the, the amazing... Uh, climate change had a huge profile raise in 2019, and it's, it's important that we, we pick that momentum back up as soon as COVID uh, is over. Yeah, and um, the final slide on that is yeah, it's a I call to a, action, right? Why can't the media visualize climate solutions? Exactly, uh, I, exactly. I, I think in 2019 we were starting to move from, you know, identifying the causes of climate change through to the impacts, and the third part of this narrative, the most important part, is starting to document and address climate solutions. And I, I think I wanted to end my talk on a on a kind of rallying call, really, that as we're emerging out of lockdown, as the photographers are getting back to work, that the, the climate agenda uh, um, is at a point of disruption after COVID, and that's a, a kind of point not to celebrate. We need to be sensitive, but it is certainly a call to action for environmental photographers to, uh, to produce their best work and, and hit the ground running as soon as we can. Wonderful, Toby. Thank you so much for your contribution and, uh, and sharing these insights with us. The work continues. Uh, research is important for photography. And um, yeah, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll go to the next item, uh, which is, uh, will be presented by Jerzy Brinkhoff, who is the exhibitions manager and a curator at World Press Photo Foundation. Um, he has been with the foundation since uh, 2018. And together with the rest of the team, he's responsible also for the traveling exhibition. And at this moment, he's also responsible for the exhibition in Amsterdam. Because of COVID-19, lots of exhibitions uh, have been uh, not taking place worldwide. Good to know that lots of them are opening up as well. And uh, we're very happy that the exhibition in Amsterdam has opened. And uh, Jerzy, you were responsible for that and you will take us through some of the images. Yes, that we I have will. on display. Yeah, I'm also, of course, incredibly happy that the exhibition is open. It has been uh, quite a challenge. We, uh, we adapted it fully to all Corona measures, so uh, luckily all of our visitors can visit safely. Um, of course, the exhibition is, a, is uh, reliant on our annual photo contest. Uh, and of course, the photo contest is divided up into eight different categories. Uh, but we do see some themes throughout the categories, and I'll be, I'll be talking you through some of them. So, for example, this image, Toby has also uh, talked about a few of these. Uh, the first theme that I'd like to discuss is the issue of uh, uh, wildfires, uh, which is, of course, a global trend, or it, it, at least it's on the rise globally. Um, and what we, we see it coming back in our contest. Uh, this year, it's focused mainly on the United States and on Australia. And we see some incredibly strong and powerful uh, images. For example, this one by Noah Berger. This is in California. 
uh, and it's, I think it's an incredible shot. Uh, just to clarify, what we're seeing uh, is not a lake. Some people think it's a lake, but we're looking at a, a hillside uh, that is on fire, and just right behind the flames, the hillside drops. And according to Noah himself, this is an incredi incredibly rare shot, and it takes uh, you know, incredible preparation as well, uh, which he always puts in. Uh, he even told us that he installed a ladder on his car just so that he would be able to take shots like this. We've got this great picture by Sean Davey. This is in Australia. This is at, uh, um, at sort of an, um, uh, at an emergency place where people can gather that, that have fled from, uh, from the forest fires. And uh, he said something beautiful when we interviewed him, and this is a quote. Uh, the children appear to be very happy, and in that microcosm, the gravity of the surrounding situation seemed suspended by their innocence, which I think is just a very beautiful way of describing this picture. Uh, you know, we're seeing, we're looking at, at kids and their life uh, really just continued. Um, this picture won in the contemporary issues category, the previous one in the environment category. And the next one, this is a sports story by Wally Scollage, um, and we're looking at Paradise, California, we're looking at a football team, the Paradise Bobcats. Uh, of course, Paradise, uh, the Paradise Fire was the most destructive fire in Californian history, uh, recorded. And we're looking at a sports team that is returning to their field. All of their homes have been destroyed, but the field has been left, um, well, slightly untouched. And they're now returning to the field to continue practicing. Some are commuting for up to 90 minutes, um, but you really see here that sports is becoming a pillar of their community, uh, a community that's, of course, trying to rebuild their town. This is, I find, a very interesting picture because, of course, it looks like they're cheering for the match, but they're actually cheering for the first responders that were, of course, first at the scene of the fire when it started. And this is someone that's just releasing his nerves. Um, and then another incredible story is by Matthew Abbott. This is in New South Wales. Of course, there were uh, you know, fires in Australia, mainly New South Wales uh, and Victoria, but also parts of Queensland and South Australia. Uh, and what we're seeing here is just well, I think horrifying uh, pictures. Usually the fires in Australia, they're named individually, but this, this time the fire season was just so uh, bad that they just called, called it the Black Summer. Um, aluminum melts at 660 degrees Celsius, so that just goes to show how, how hot these fires get. Um, it was the first time that these people had access to a Boeing 737, so that says a lot as well about the severity of these fires. Um, and we've got this one horrible picture. But interesting to note, life also continues, uh, even though despite these fires. For example, the photographer, Matthew Abbott, he got married uh, during the wildfires, and he says that there is a certain, you know, orange glow uh, in all of his wedding photographs. And, I mean, I imagine that uh, this theme will keep coming back uh, over, the, over the next few years. Then. Another theme that has been present in our exhibition, uh, as you will know, Lars, is the issue of poaching. Uh, we've seen poaching of elephants and of rhinos in past years. Uh, and this year, we've got a fantastic story by Brent Sturton, and he has photographed poaching of pangolins all around the world. Um, a report that came out in 2017 by Traffic, which is the Wildlife Trade Monitoring Network, stated that pangolins are now the most illegally traded uh, animal around the world, with over one million animals that have been poached and trafficked uh, in, in the past 10 years. Uh, and even though there has been a ban on trading these animals since 2017, the um, trading continues. Um, and it's really, it's all across the world. Uh, the first image, I'll go back to it. This is actually at a rescue facility in Zimbabwe. Um, this is at a market in Cameroon. Uh, what we're seeing here, this is actually a rescue group. They're trying to stop the poaching of the pangolins. Uh, and the pangolins are used for two reasons. One is their scales. They're scaly skinned animals and their scales are believed to have healing powers. Uh, even though there's no scientific base for that whatsoever. The scales of pangolins are made of carotene, which is, of course, the same material as our fingernails. Uh, but we see a medicine doctor here mixing scales. Um, and then another big market, uh, because the scales, they mainly go to China, 
But another big, mar big market for these pangolins is actually the United States, which a lot of people don't know and don't expect. Uh, and that is mainly for the meat. Uh, their meat is also consumed. This pangolin that we see in this image here was uh, put into a meal and that meal was sold for 1,000 euros. Uh, so even though there has been this ban on the trade of pangolins, uh, you know, without uh, further measures and people actually paying a thousand euros for a meal, you can imagine that this is an, an ongoing issue. Yeah. Jersey, the uh, nature and environment category has become quite a substantial uh, contribution to the result. Uh, do you also experience when you do tours that the audience reflects uh, on it and responds to these photos well? Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the one of the of course the reason why we introduced the environment category is well, there were several reasons, but one of them was that it's uh, probably the most pressing issue of our time, uh, and we see that coming back from our audience as well. They they recognize it too. But what is very interesting, and that's why it was so interesting, what Toby mentioned as well, is that for them it becomes tangible when you link it to their local. Uh, situation, right? Um, and I think that is something that I'm hoping that we'll see more and more, these local implications of global climate uh, crisis issues. Yeah. One of the uh, images that we have uh, uh, also in the presentation are, is the work of Esther Horvat, um, the, 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 the polar bears. We're going to switch to uh, Esther now and, and talk through uh, her work. Thank you so much. Uh, people can visit the exhibition in Amsterdam. Buy a ticket. Luckily in Amsterdam, buy tickets online, but we're also opening in uh, Rome, Prague, Berlin, and Sydney in August. Uh, so, uh, you know, despite the current crisis, the exhibition is slowly but surely opening up. That's good news. Thank you so much, Jersey. You're welcome. Thanks. Our next guest, which you can see on the screen, is Esther Horvat. And she's a documentary photographer, a fellow at the International League of Conservation Photographers, a member of the Photo Society, and a science photographer for Alfred Wegener Institute. Hemholtz Center for Polar and Marine Research in Germany. Since 2015, Horvat has des dedicated her photography to the polar regions, especially to the Arctic Ocean, documenting scientific expeditions and behind the scenes science stories. She follows the work of multiple science groups that are working to better understand the changing of the polar regions. Esther, welcome. Um, you're also a guest for, uh, for, uh, with uh, our program today because you uh, had a winning image this year. It's the slide that we have been using uh, uh, all through the presentations. How was it for you to, uh, to win at World Press Photo? Hi Lars. Winning at uh, World Press Photo was absolute uh, dream comes true. And I remember when I started photography, that was for me something what uh, I wish to achieve. And uh, just being nominated was for me a beautiful, uh, grateful feeling. And of course, winning the category was something very special. Yeah, one of the photos that we uh, are now showing, uh, the two polar bears, uh, that's not me, of course, but uh, the one in the back. Um, tell me what is going on on this photo. Uh, th there's two polar bears with flags. So I took this uh, photo during Mosaic expedition and this expedition actually is still going on. This is the largest uh, scientific expedition of our time, which is in the Central Arctic Ocean. And for one entire year, Polarstern icebreaker drifts uh, with the Arctic Ocean uh, drift. It's called the Transpolar Drift. And scientists on board um, conduct different scientific research, climate science uh, research. And during this expedition, we got um, on many occasions, uh, visitors, polar bears. And what happens here is I took this picture from the vessel as uh, a polar bear mom and a polar bear cub came close to us. They were sniffing around different equipments and they were very curious. And here they were just about like 20, 30 meter uh, away from the ship and checking out the flags around the, uh, around the vessel. One of the questions uh, that we discussed with Toby uh, in the beginning of the presentation is uh, visuals about climate change. Uh, one of the points that he has been raising uh, before is that uh, photos of polar bears seems to be have used quite an awful lot. What is your view on that? 
So uh, I'm not an, a nature photographer. I'm a, a, a human photographer and I uh, follow the stories of scientists. But in this photo story, what I was doing about this expedition, I was hoping that I can include also an image showing polar bears as we were in the land of polar bears. But I wanted to show it in a way that's showing us to be there on the sea ice, in the, also being there in a polar darkness. And then coming and like having them as visitors around us. So I wanted to show like a complete, uh, a full picture. And uh, the entire story, what I was working on is that uh, we all know that Arctic Ocean is melting and Arctic is the most rapidly changing environment. But for me, I'm very interested in that how do we get our climate data? Who are the scientists? They are delivering a very extremely important science, uh, climate research data for us. And how do they work and live in the most harsh environments of our planet? So in my work, what I'm focusing on, I want to show the story behind the climate data, yeah. how scientists work. Yeah. You're part of the uh, International League of Conservation Photographers. Can you explain us a little bit what the, that league is? Uh, we also have Christina Mittelmeier here, who's, who was the founder of this uh, organization. And it's a group of uh, photographers that focuses and concentrates on environmental and cultural issues to raise awareness about the changes and uh, hoping to further positive changes. Yeah. You brought us five photos of uh, your travels that we would like to go through them. I will will go through them. Um, this is uh, this. It's total dark. Uh, how, how a photographer that needs to work in the dark. How do you do that? Can, can you talk us a little bit through these images while I uh, I scroll through them? Yes. So for me, uh, working in this darkness, I was in the expedition for three and a half months. And from this time, we were in a complex, complete darkness from two and a half months. And uh, for me, it was something the, uh, the most magical, um, most magical words and light what I have ever been. And uh, because it was so interesting that the only light we had came from the, from the vessel and uh, only from the headlamp of the of the scientists and maybe i would like to go back to the very first uh, picture to tell a little bit more about the the photos if you can do that so uh, this is this was the view what we constantly had uh, for two and a half months that uh, the only only light what we have comes from the vessel and the he headlamp of the of the scientists and everything else was in completely black darkness and also the colors disappeared and uh, so it was like seeing constantly these silhouettes uh, walking on the sea ice, on the moving uh, sea ice. And we were in, uh, constantly in, in many storms where you, you cannot hear anything. You are walking in on, on a constant moving sea ice. And now we, we can go to the next slide. Sea ice uh, constantly moved and uh, broke and ridges created. And uh, walking in this darkness was uh, also very dangerous and you had to be very careful. And, I remember the very first time sea ice moved under my feet. I thought that somebody started a generator. It was so loud. And uh, it feels like an earthquake. And um, the first reaction, what you would have inside of you, that you would love to run away because you feel that the cracks are opening and creates it by or next to your feet. But of course, the most safe way to react and uh, do is you have to stand still. And uh, scientists were using different tools, like for example, sleds to cross ridges, to cross ridges safely, because um, in this darkness, you, uh, you barely could see where you step. And beside all of this, uh, we were in a land of polar bears, so we also had to watch out if there, is, if there are any polar bears around. Yeah, it's, it's human beings uh, working in a very harsh environment. Uh, you talked about uh, how to, to navigate through the landscape. Is there ever a, a sense of fear there? Because it's dark, you're, you're not familiar, you cannot see very much. Is that something that plays a role? Uh, everybody is very much uh, prepared for this type of work, but I can t tell you from my personal uh, my personal experience is that I constantly had an alert feeling. I, I was not afraid, but it was a constant alert uh, feeling to be ready for any kind of emergency, but we went through a very uh, intense training, so we were prepared for that. 
But I re realized that when I came back after three and a half months, that's when I realized that this alert feeling, just uh, I just released this feeling. And, but I was in this tension for three and a half months. This picture, uh, if you go back to this, yes. uh, blue, uh, this picture we had, we were in this blue light for about like 10 days before the complete darkness arrived. And it just, uh, it's, for me, it's just incredible to imagine that this is an atmospheric research station. We are here 600 meter away on the moving sea ice, uh, 600 meter away from the, from the ship. And there is already uh, power coming from the ship. There are still some instruments on the sea ice. And here we are standing on about a 70 centimeter sea ice. And for me, this logistical challenge and, uh, was, and also the entire setup, what was done for science, uh, just uh, extremely interesting to, to be able to create uh, this infrastructure on a, on a constantly moving and breaking up land. And what was the reason why this uh, expedition is so unique? Because, uh, because especially uh, of the winter part, a lot of first time measurements were done during the, the winter time and uh, scientists are now analyze, uh, analyzing uh, the result. For example, here scientists are taking ice cores. Several hundred ice cores were taken during, uh, during this part when I've been and here they are analyzing methane as the most harmful um, gas for our climate. They are melting the sea ice and they are analyzing the, uh, the methane in the sea ice. And this was the view after three months being on a, in, in darkness, being on an on a ice floe in the Central Arctic Ocean, and we were only hundreds of us. And uh, on the horizon, a Russian icebreaker, a supply icebreaker arrives and this is when the crew exchange happened. And it was a very interesting feeling to be in a land which felt constantly like being in a different planet and a moon. And then another um, group of scientists and crew came and took, uh, to, to, took or continued this expedition, which is running for an entire year. There are still scientists, uh, so it, it goes until uh, October. You're, you're talked about uh, photographing human beings, of course, they're working there. I, we have three photos of that that you selected to show uh, life goes on also in the dark. Uh, but it also gets you this very strange, uh, yeah, what is this? What are we looking at? It almost looks like Star Wars. Yes, so um, I'm very interested that beside the scientific work and all these extreme harsh conditions, I'm very interested that hope people live in these places because there is no cell phone, no internet, no TV, no radio, there is nothing. So, but uh, life still goes on and people have free time. So I'm very interested in how people, how scientists, uh, crews spend their free time. And uh, this was uh, uh, with uh, the previous picture was a Halloween party and it was mandatory to dress up. So people were using whatever they could find on the on the vessel and they were very creative and uh, these different type of events are also very important being so isolated from the from the world and i'm also looking for like for example this picture i'm always looking for human stories like he he was uh, his carsten or helicopter pilot chief pilot and uh, i i just find it so beautiful that he was uh, sewing uh, flags green flags well, 30 of them and they were put it on the, they were placing it on the different helicopter, helicopter pads where they were landing. And uh, with every single, with each of my pictures, I'm always looking for these human stories that uh, with one picture, I try to st tell a story of that person. And for example, the first one with the hair cutting, that's, uh, that was our captain. And uh, if you maybe just can go back to that one. Yes, so he's, he was our captain and he's actually now returning after spending nine months on the expedition. And uh, here we are in the, uh, in the metal workshop of the, of the vessel and one of the officer yeah. is cutting his hair. And every night at seven o'clock, there was a barber shop in the metal workshop. Esther, you um, have returned to, uh, to, your, to your house, your studio. Uh, back to uh, to uh, yeah, almost say normal life. If we can say COVID nineteen gets us to normal life, you're you're invited to one of the exhibitions uh, that will take place hopefully uh, end of this year. Which is, do you know? Uh, can you tell us which one that is? Uh, I'm invited at this point for uh, for two exhibitions, uh, and uh, the first one will be in Budapest. 
And um, I will be there for the opening. I will also give a lecture and I will also will collaborate uh, universities to give workshops also for them. And I'm also invited in Germany. I hope you can uh, you can uh, join us very very often to share uh, the stories that matter. Thank you so much for talking through the work and uh, congratulations about winning at World Press Photo and uh, we'll hope to see you uh, more in the future. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next part of the program is focusing on photo books. Uh, in the World Press Photo House in Amsterdam we have the PhotoQ bookshop. Uh, currently closed because of COVID-19, but of course you can always uh, go there and browse through the inventory uh, on a digital way through the web shop. We have asked Edi Peters, who's the founder of the bookshop, to take us through uh, some of the books that he enjoys very much and we're going to take a little clip uh, to, to watch this. Secreto Sarayaku is a brand new photo book by documentary photographer Misha Vallejo from Ecuador. He brought copies to us while he was an artist in residence last month at Docking Station, just around the corner of Wilpress Photo House here in Amsterdam. We knew Misha already from two earlier books he published. In 2016, Al Otro Lado, about daily life along the Ecuadorian and Colombian border region, and Sieto Punto Ocho, about a disastrous earthquake that hit his country in 2018. In his new book, Secreto Sarayaku, Vallejo gives us a colorful impression of the life of the Sarayaku people, indigenous in El Oriente, the Amazonic region of Ecuador. He worked in close cooperation with the Sarayaku. In the text they explain how they live, about their relation with all the living creatures around them and the supreme beings that protect the whole ecosystem. Texts are in Spanish, English and Quechua, the language of the Sarayaku. Maybe that sounds all quite serious, but the book has a lot of humor too. On some pages, for instance, you will see signs that give us the impression that the Sarayaku have their own script. But they are illustrations of binary code, computer language. Yes, the Sarayaku, only a few thousand people, are not only rooted in ancient times, they also are very well with internet and social media. They live not only in the real jungle, but also in a metaphorical one, in which they are continuously threatened by government, oil companies and the like. And they say, we don't want to disappear without being known by the world. Secreto Sarayaku is not only a book, it's a project with a lot of partners. A website coming up, as well as a video documentary and a podcast. Curious? You'll find all the information in our online shop. And Misha, stay safe in Ecuador. The real books are here in my hands. It's a beautiful book. Uh, it's great to have photo books uh, to tell stories. And uh, we're happy with the PhotoQ bookshop to share with us these, uh, these books. We also have his former books there. And um, we're looking forward to, to receive you in our, in our store. We will move on to our next guest, which we introduce shortly. Christina Mietermeyer is a um, marine biologist and an activist who pioneered the concept and the field of conservation photography. Mittermeier founded the International League of Conservation Photographers in 2005 to provide a platform for photographers working on env environmental issues. And in 2015, she also co-founded Sea Legacy, a non-profit organization dedicated to the protect protection of the ocean. Sea Legacy harnesses the power of communication technology to educate and inform the world about the incredible beauty of the ocean and all of the challenges that it faces in the wake of climate crisis. In 2020, on the 50, uh, 50th uh, anniversary of Earth Day, Mittermeier announced the most ambitious project of her career, Only One, a new collective for organizations that uses digital technology and visual storytelling to catalyze lasting cultural change with the ultimate goal of conserving the world's oceans from now into per 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 perpetuity. Christina, welcome to uh, our program. Uh, very ambitious and dedicated programs. Can you talk a little bit about how do you handle all these, uh, these, these foundations, these initiatives, and what drives you forward with it? Good morning. I'm uh, reaching you from British Columbia. Um, and that's a really good question, Lars. Uh, 
I never set out to be a photographer. For me, it's always been about how to make the planet a better place. And what I've tried to do with my work is uh, think in an innovative way about not just how I elevate impact media, but how um, we build an army of storytellers that can have impact on our planet. Um, I don't do it alone. I have an incredible staff of about 20 people, and we work in partnership with over 70 organizations. So it's, it's hardly just me. It's a collaboration. Yeah. Um, how did that grow into 17 or 70 organizations? Do they, do they connect to you uh, by themselves? Do you invite them? Uh, well, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the history of all this. So when I started the International League of Conservation Photographers, I thought that if, if we simply empowered more photographers, we could start moving the needle on environmental issues. And even though it has had an impact because you can see the incredible work of photographers like Esther and uh, so many of the other photographers that are telling important stories, it just didn't seem enough because we always came back to the problem of distribution. Unless you can get the work out there and you know actually move people into action, um, more photographers don't make a difference. So my partner, photographer Paul Nicklin, who is actually a winner at World Press Photo as well, and I started Sea Legacy. Um, it was just out of frustration, Lars, wanting to tell stories of one of the most difficult places to document, which of course is uh, the ocean. And we didn't have any distribution channel except for our own social media and our partnership with National Geographic. And we started posting stories. And um, I like to think about it, uh, uh, you, you know that scene out of the movie Forrest Gump when he starts running across the country and then he looks behind them and there's thousands of people following him. That's kind of what happened. We started telling stories that were very personal and were very emotional. Uh, of course, always founded in science, but they really resonated with people. And when you start getting such a large social media following, um, you start seeing really interesting trends. What we realized is that people are no longer happy with just liking or following or sharing. They really want to do more. And there is a sense of frustration in the inability to act when you feel compelled by your emotions. And I'm so happy uh, to, that Toby's here because I sense collaboration coming on. I mean, I, I love the way that you're thinking, Toby, and, and the seven principles that you describe are, are things that I've been doing more, more than anything intuitively, but I would love to think about them in a more systematic way. So we started thinking, if you have all these followers, how do you um, mobilize them into action? And we started creating campaigns. And these were social media campaigns that we were doing in partnership with other organizations, but they worked. You know, when you show an audience a, an emotional, compelling piece of media and you give them an opportunity to act, they will. So, for example, in, um, in 2016, we were um, asked to participate in a campaign uh, by a group of local activists in Norway to try to stop oil drilling in Lofoten. And... Within a matter of weeks, we had over 56,000 signatures that compelled the prime minister to take action and make the ban on oil drilling permanent. Yeah. We followed that with another campaign in the coast of California to ban death nets. And again, very powerful piece of media. Within a couple of weeks, we had 120,000 signatures that we presented to the California legislature. And within a matter of four months, they had banned death nets. Yeah. So we started to think, you know, how do we make this more systematic? And, and that's when the idea of only one was born. Yeah. You, uh, only one is, is highlighting three initial journeys, as they are called. First one is 30 times 30, a global commitment to protect 30% of the ocean by 2030. The second one focuses on drawdown, which recasts the ocean as a solution to climate change and not just as a victim. And then you have other journeys and narratives, including work for plastic and pollution, humans of the ocean, coral reefs, biodiversity, and fishing and food. These are the main topics, I guess, that, uh, that, that play a role. Um, do, you, do you have to follow up on all these uh, stories? When, when do you decide to move on to the next one, uh, to be honest? Because there's so much work to be done. Yes, there is so much work to be done. Um, the journeys um, are actually not my idea. Uh, we are following a very inspiring and hopeful narrative that was presented by a group of scientists last year 
on a paper that they titled, uh, We Can Restore the Health and Abundance to Our Oceans by 2050. And they provided us with a blueprint of how we get there. Uh, the scientists uh, outlined six what they call wedges that need to be addressed in order to, to restore health to the oceans. And Lars, I've always felt very compelled to take action when the motion is forward and positive and hopeful. Um, I, you know, very much like Toby was talking about protests, pushing against something always feels very, you know, conflictive to me. So having this blueprint of actions that we can take and we can guide people through, uh, to me, is very powerful. So the journeys that we have designed for only one are, um, we're following the, the oldest story on the planet, you know, people are compelled to act on stories. So these are journeys that follow the hero's journey. You know, we're Frodo going towards the mountain and we're going to take people on very personal emotional stories to achieve 30% protection for the ocean by 2030. Uh, we're, go we're going to begin with a series on Antarctica. And there's an international push right now to protect, uh, to create three marine protected areas in what would become the largest act of conservation in the history of humanity. So we have um, a series of episodes on video, but also long form stories because the internet is searched uh, by words, not by photographs. And the most important thing is that once people watch these episodes, it, they are compelled to take action. So imagine that you're watching your favorite Netflix show and just when the hero needs your help, you're presented with an opportunity to act right then and there. That's what only one does. And so we do this in partnership with other conservation organizations. And uh, my favorite thing about only one is that every user gets their own dashboard. So over time, you can see how many actions you have taken, how many pieces of impact media you've watched, how many petitions you have signed, how many dollars you've donated, how many mangroves you have planted. And it, it is that sense of accomplishment in the community that really moves the needle. Yeah. There's very often talk about uh, can photography change the world or can one photo change the world. I just noticed that you talk a lot about stories. Is it uh, important to have photo stories, visual stories, a video to get across uh, this, this, uh, this topic and to find solutions? Or is it also possible to have one photo to take care of that? You know, Lars, I think uh, no organization um, represents the power of a story in a single photograph more than world press photo, but we also know how incredibly difficult it is to achieve. So as photographers, we're always striving to create that image that tells the whole story. And that is just very difficult. So the, the audience that I'm trying to move is an audience that is not already invested in environmental uh, consciousness. These are audiences that may be on the verge of you know, being converted or who don't care at all. So we cannot, um, we cannot lean on the single photograph as the tool to move them. We have to lean on uh, more traditional storytelling. So we go to short video episodes and we go to the photo essay with a written word uh, in an effort really to try to bring, to meet people wherever they are. And uh, I liked something that Toby said very much. Uh, people react in a very different way to an image or a story depending on their political leaning. And we want only one to be open to all political leanings, to all races, to all ethnicities. A lot of the content we're producing is in other languages, very much geared to local people. And uh, um, yeah. Yeah, I have a question from, uh, from uh, for our, our uh, online audience by Alice. Uh, she's also a photographer working on climate and env environmental impacts. And she says that she sometimes grapples with photographs of suffering and vulnerability. How can or should photography be used as a tool to empower subjects and give them agency rather than creating a dynamic where the subject is passive and their reality is fixed? It's one of the topics that you will hear a lot recently in photography. Is that a uh, uh, Such a good question, Larson. You know, I've always taken my cues in how to tell stories from the best storytellers in the history of humanity. And my favorite by far is Dr. Martin Luther King. And he didn't start his famous speech with, I have a nightmare. You know, he painted a positive picture of where we need to go. And then he took us on a narrative that shows us that we have a long way to get there, but there is a path. Uh, and then he reminds us that not everything is okay and that we have a lot of work ahead of us, but 
unless you take your audiences on that path from despair to hope and you provide the positive action they can take and then reward them for taking that action, it just feels like the despair that audiences feel when they're not presented with the opportunity to participate is paralyzing, you know, and I've seen it in so many documentaries. You watch these documentaries and you're ready to take action. And by the time you leave the movie theater or whatever, you are even more, uh, you know, apathetic and despair than before. So finding those solutions is critical. And that's what only one does, and we don't do it on our own. Um, there's over 5,000 conservation organizations working on marine issues in the United States alone. Each and every one of them has an important story to tell. Each and every one of them has identified solutions that people can actually participate on. And only one is the conduit that takes people to those solutions. Yeah. In the, in the preparation for this, uh, for this uh, talk, uh, I looked at a statistic that, you, that we shared that uh, by engaging only 3.5% of the global population, which is approximately 300 million people, we can create a significant tipping point for meaningful and systematic change. The, the reach that you have on, on social media, as you, s you spoke about, having your own platform, uh, if we, how large is that audience that you uh, seem to have in your own control? You know, as large as it is, um, it's not big enough. Uh, the Sea Legacy Collective of Photographers, we can reach 15 million people combined. And then thanks to the media partner that we partnership that we have with uh, organizations like National Geographic, we can reach 150 million people. But it's funny, whenever you find a really impactful piece of media, like the photograph and the video of the starving polar bear, um, when, when people start sharing that and it goes viral, uh, you can reach a much larger group of people. Uh, in the case of the starving polar bear, we reach two and a half billion people. That is really significant. So the statistic of three and a half percent came from social studies. Uh, and, you know, we know from events like uh, the Arab Spring, uh, the falling of Mubarak, that was a Twitter storm, that if you mobilize a small segment of the population, you can really begin a revolution. And so you have to inform a much larger percent of people, but you only need three and a half percent of the population to actually take an action. Yeah. And uh, that's when you, you can start creating tipping points. So that's the size of the audience we want to be reaching on a daily basis. Lots of the work that, uh, that we just looked at uh, shows uh, um, animals in their natural habitat. We also saw uh, people uh, in, the, in the ocean on surfboards. Uh, how do you feel about humans being part of, of nature? I mean, photographing them with their surfboard or being active in nature. Do people belong in nature? What do you, what's your view on that? Oh, Lars, this, is, this has been my life's work as a photographer to find the confluence of people and nature. And uh, I started my career photographing indigenous people, and then I moved to wildlife, and then I began doing underwater photography. And now, finally, I have all the skills to be able to tell the story of humans and the ocean from the perspective of the ocean. Uh, but very much uh, uh, creating that link, that bridge between humans and nature is paramount to success in any environmental issue. And um, at only one, we have a, a complete hub called Humans of the Ocean, just telling the stories of people who depend on the ocean every day, the heroes that are working to protect the ocean in all sorts of uh, you know, types of work, including people like Esther, um, scientists, photographers, uh, indigenous leaders, and uh, you cannot separate humans and nature. And, you know, through storytelling, we can start creating that connection again. Yeah. Right before we started, we, you, you, you informed us about uh, your, your latest acti activities. Now I heard you have actually, you uh, acquired a big boat. Can you tell a story <laughs> about the big boat? What is the plan with the big boat? Um, it's very expensive to work out at sea and uh, we spend a lot of money on boats. So we decided to instead invest in buying our own boat. Uh, the Sea Legacy One is a catamaran, it's a 62 foot boat. And Paul and I bought it with our own money because we want the freedom to do whatever we want. <laughs> and uh, right now because of COVID, it's sitting in Annapolis, Maryland, but it's uh, completely retrofitted. It's painted orange and it's ready to be out at sea. And we're going to be following these journeys of uh, 30 by 30 uh, to protect 30% of the ocean, uh, 
you know, recasting the ocean as a solution to climate change, telling the stories of humans of the planet, and we're hopefully going to be doing it from the Sea Legacy One. Yeah. Big plans, big ideas, big initiatives. When do you feel that you are successful? Do you have a certain goal in mind where you would say, I have achieved something so large or something so important that I'm, I'm satisfied? You know, the events that are happening in the United States this week have been so incredibly disturbing because it really has become apparent that we cannot solve, we cannot tackle environmental justice unless we tackle social justice. And what I'm thinking about these days is this intersectional environmentalism. And I think the day that I can retire and put my camera down is the day that we can change our economic systems so that they don't leave nature and humanity behind and that we can all stand together and tackle the big issues of our generation, especially climate change. Also, you have a dream. Oh, I have a dream. Yeah. I hope your dream comes true. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your work with us. And it's incredible to see what you, what you do, what you achieve and what you share with us. And um, let's hope that your dream comes true. Uh, Christina Mietermeyer, thank you very much. Thank you, Lars. And if you're interested in uh, learning when only one comes online, which it will be in a matter of weeks now, go to only.one and sign your name and be part of the journey. Okay. Three and a half percent of the world population just watched. So we're going to make a change. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We've already come to the end of the program. Uh, I hope you enjoyed these stories that have been shared by, uh, by our great guests. Um, I also hope that you keep in mind that World Environment Day is an important day, also in these days where COVID-19 is, is dominating the news. We'd like to thank our, uh, our partners and sponsors, uh, the, the Dutch Postcode Lottery, Egon and at PwC, uh, for their contribution to World Press Photo. We really like to thank all our guests. And uh, I'd like to point out that uh, in the near future, we'll have another uh, uh, live cast, which is on the 19th of June, Watch out on, uh, on our social media channels as well. And if you want to know more about uh, my thoughts about photojournalism, do you have to speak Dutch? Because the interview was done in Dutch. Uh, look it up on the uh, website of uh, Pakkas de Zwijger. This was uh, the second live cast of World Press Photo, and I hope to see you soon in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.